Let's bring in our panel now of CBSN political contributors. Leslie Sanchez is in Houston. She's a Republican strategist. And here in New York, Nomiki Konst, a Democratic strategist. Ladies, welcome to you both. Good evening. Uh, Nomiki, let me start with you. The New York Times says that Republicans are, quote, outmuscling Democrats on these confirmations. What is the Democratic strategy at this point? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, I think, you know. <laughs> Le Leslie can't contain herself. OK, yes. Listen, there, there you would think that the Republicans made up the majority of the country based on, on how they're ruling right now. This is all about political capital. I mean, of course they have all the seats pretty much everywhere across the country, majority across the country. So they have a lot of political leverage there, but they're not so much unified within their own party. I mean, you've got the Lindsey Grahams and the John McCains who see a very different world than Donald Trump. Now, this nominee for Supreme Court is very much in line with the majority of the Republican Party. But the Democrats need to understand they don't have much political capital with their base right now. And I think some members, the four who voted for uh, the Supreme Court pick, they're the ones who are, who are still playing by a different operating system. They're still thinking, I have to run as a blue dog candidate, a conservative Democrat, not understanding that the base of the party is is much angrier and much more progressive. So I don't think they know who they're answering to, and they're sure, surely not listening to their leadership. Leslie, how do you see it? <laughs> I think they're operating on DOS. Uh, you know, to, the wrong <laughs> operating system by far. Uh, you, you know, what's interesting here, I think even from kind of taking off of that last segment where Jan was talking about it, this is very much uh, the Democrats' own doing haunting them now, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to this issue of the nuclear option. She's act exactly right. It was 20 2013, Democrats took the strict party line vote to, act, to to really employ this nuclear option and do the simple majority vote. Uh, and Republicans were furious. They felt that they really had no political capital, to use that term, in any of these fights. And that was one of the reasons you saw that the former AG Loretta, Loretta Lynch move forward on her confirmation. So uh, Republicans have been on that end of the spear for a very long time. And I think that's also why you may see something unprecedented here. And that is, for the first time in three decades, all of the initial nominees for Trump's cabinet be confirmed. Um, because normally there's somebody who comes out because of not paying back taxes for a household employee or whatever it may be. The times have changed, but a lot of that is because of the rules of the Democrats. All right, but Leslie, let me ask you, one nomination may not go through. Two Republicans say that they're gonna vote against Betsy DeVos for education secretary. A, Leslie, does that matter? And B, what would a potentially failed confirmation mean? Well, look, going back, to, you'd have to go back to 1989 to have a time when every single initial nomination was confirmed. Uh, we could, and it was a lot of, for Elaine, for a lot of different things. You think about Linda Chavez going up for labor, and it was a household employee and the issue of taxes. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and there's always something that comes up in disclosures. That's why Democrats have been asking for more time. But things have changed now. There's such tremendous momentum to get this cabinet in early. The rules have changed, like we talked about, because of the Democrats. And Betsy DeVos is very qualified. Yes, granted, she doesn't have that uh, public sector education experience that gives a lot of, of peace and reassurance, like we had with a Rod Page, who was a superintendent of schools in Houston. Uh, but does she have the capacity to get a team together that understands and can, and can really hear those concerns? And I do believe she does. That's the capacity these senators are looking for. Okay, Nomiki, you're I, making a face. I mean, I'm not going to debate Betsy DeVos's qualifications other than the fact that she's an incredible fundraiser, and that it makes her supremely <laughs> qualified for anything on Trump's cabinet. But what I will debate is how our standards are just so much lower, even for Republicans. It's like, well, you know, they know what they're talking about when they're reading a script. They don't have a bunch of dirt under, you know, in skeletons in the closet. You know, they're not horrifying. I mean, that's what I'm hearing from the Democrats right now, and I think that's what's really concerning. You look at Rex Tillerson, uh, you look at a lot of these nominees, and you hear the response, well, they're not as bad as the other guys, and we have to pick our battles. No, I think the Democrats need to understand right now, th all of the battles are battles. Mm -hmm. All of them, because they have very little political leverage. And so if they can use every opportunity they can to make a case for why his choices are poor, that hurts his brand and that hurts their brand, those nominees. And, and my concern is that some Democrats are more concerned with saving their juice for the big fights 
um, not realizing that they're possibly endangering their own careers just because the Democratic base is not buying it right now, and they're angry. So what about then, based on what you just said, Nomiki, Neil Gorsuch, mm -hmm. how do you think the Democrats should approach that nomination? Well, I've already seen several tweets from um, and responses from people who know uh, know Neil Gorsuch from, from Harvard Law uh, or from just different interactions, and they're saying things like, he's perfectly qualified, except he's got a far right-wing record. You know, he somewhere lies between on, this, on the, 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 the metrics that they use between Clarence Thomas and Antonin Scalia, and he's 49 years old. And so that has no reflection about the future of the country where most of the justices in our history have stood on the Constitution. And I think that any of those Democrats who think he's qualified should start to look at his record a little bit more and realize that this is going to be somebody, if this is the moderate uh, that he puts forward, who, who, who's to say what the next two are going to be? Uh, Leslie, let me ask you, the president and vice president seem to have somewhat different messages about whether to use the so-called nuclear option to fight Democrats on the confirmation for Judge Gorsuch. How should we understand these two messages? What's really interesting, Elaine, and that's probably the most powerful question, is when we're looking at a new administration that's taking a lot of executive action through executive order, the, one of the issues that's going to be for, before the court is this deference to executive authority. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so it, it doesn't behoove the administration to have to to go in there and have the vice president make the deciding uh, vote, uh, you really want the Senate as an independent chamber to make its own decision on how to do that, even though they're getting a very strong push from the president, uh, just to keep that separation of powers in balance. I think it's more about the optics of that than anything. And that's really what the grumbling is, uh, both internally and externally from the party, is keeping that separate. And if they can do that, that would, that would be better for everyone. Hmm. All right, finally, ladies, I wanna get both of your perspectives on some comments that President Trump made Wednesday during what the White House called a listening session for Black History Month. Take a listen. Last month, we celebrated the life of the Reverend Martin Luther King. Jr., whose incredible example is unique in American history. You read all about Dr. Martin Luther King uh, a week ago when uh, somebody said, I took the statue out of my office. And it turned out that that was fake news. They said the, uh, the statue, the bust of Dr. Martin Luther King was taken out of the office. And uh, it was uh, never even touched. So I think it was a disgrace, but that's the way the press is. All right, Leslie, let me start with you, because I read the transcript of that event, and you had these African-American supporters basically voicing why it is that they feel so connected to Donald Trump, and this was obviously an opportunity. They had cameras in there uh, for him to mark this occasion at the beginning of Black History Month, and yet what came out of that um, was this lashing of the media once again. Is this perhaps another example of the president stepping on his own message there? I don't necessarily see that here, uh, Elaine. I, I mean, I think that's so much what we have to get used to with his style and his cadence. We always know that the media is in the crosshair, so, uh, that he really is blaming. What he's trying to say here, it, it appears, is that he is trying to do the right thing, especially with building these relations. Uh, taking this step, but that he's misunderstood in some way, and the media did it. He had a he had a bad guy. Uh, it was it the right place, probably not, but it's definitely in line with his style, and I, I think that's part of what that's the unwrapping of Donald Trump that we're going to have to get used to for the next four years. No, Mickey, how do you see it? I don't think we should get used to any of this. I think as members of the media, we should be calling him out for these behaviors. I mean, he was there to talk about one thing and completely went off topic, uh, and start talking about fake news again because it's it's you know he's Nobody on message. Nobody clarified it, No, Miki. He clarified it. I mean, I, I, but, I see but he was there point, to talk about Black but, History Month and honoring African Americans he, and the that's legacy what he of wanted to talk about. crusading African Americans. Like, and he started talking about a fake news story and the bust of a statue. It's like he's the President of the United States now. You know, he has every opportunity to send out tweets and send out messages whenever he wants. He was there to respect those who are behind him and the history of African Americans in this country. And instead, he used it as an opportunity to go after the media and push his own brand of attacking the media. Rather than respecting I think it, individuals. Well, I think for, for, for African Americans, it was a really sensitive issue. And if he could stand there and directly uh, speak to that point, which was a, a very a painful point if people thought that that was true. So to clarify that, I think it's always the right thing. There's never a bad time to do the right thing. And I think he did the right thing. Yeah, And he can blame who he wants. 
but it, I think it would show uh, respect to the community. Yeah, by the way, the reporter who um, submitted that erroneous report apologized mm -hmm. um, for that, just for the record. All right, Leslie Sanchez in Houston and Omiki Cost <laughs> here in New York. Always lively, ladies. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. <laughs>